you remember the biblical passage where the lion will lay down with the lamb? Or when Peter cut off the soldier's ear when they came to arrest Jesus? Or what about the four horsemen of the apocalypse being war, famine, death, and pestilence? What if I told you that these verses are not as you remember them? We'll be looking at these and other examples of what are often called Mandela effects that have made their way into the Bible. Greetings and welcome to the Bible Paladin, Reading Between the Lines, where we look at interesting topics and questions pertaining to the Bible. Now this one was a particularly fun one to research and put together. If you're Generation X like me or younger, you've probably heard of the Mandela Effect. If you're older and you don't know what it is, let me break it down for you. The Mandela Effect refers to situations in which large groups of people remember something happening or looking a certain way, only to discover that historically, all evidence points to it occurring differently. The name originated, as Wikipedia sums it up, by paranormal researcher Fiona Broom, who reported having vivid and detailed memories of news coverage of South American anti-apartheid leader Nelson Mandela dying in prison in the 1980s, despite Mandela actually dying in 2013, decades after his release and after serving as president of South Africa. And when such a false memory was shared by thousands of people online, Broom theorized that this could not be a coincidence but rather could be explained by the existence of parallel realities. And I quote Wikipedia because in reality, the Mandela effect, I believe, is an internet thing. And I doubt it would have gotten much traction without the influence of social media. Now having a name for this phenomenon, there's been multiple instances of Mandela effects, typically involving memories from our childhood that we find out are different today. And most of these seem to revolve around brand names, movie quotes, celebrity names, geography, or historical events. And so let me just refer to a couple of them to give you some examples of the more talked about Mandela effects. What do you remember? Fruit Loops or Fruit Loops? Yep, the O's are made up of a cereal in both words. And speaking of fruit, which is the correct image for Fruit of the Loom? Always has been. And while we're at it, did the Monopoly guy have a monocle? Nope, never. Now, if you've been following this channel, you know that I'm a movie nerd and I've seen Star Wars, the original trilogy, dozens of times. And this is a no-brainer for me, but many get the quote wrong when Darth Vader tells Luke, I am your father. He actually says, No, I am your father. And not, Luke, I am your father. But did you see what I did when I introduced this? When Darth Vader tells Luke, I am your father. We remember it that way because that's how we talk in order to put the iconic line in context. So I believe that many of these Mandela effects can easily be explained by the way our memories work, but some are much more difficult to reconcile, especially when it comes to the Bible. So what about the Bible? Are there really Mandela effects here as well? Well, yeah, and there's actually quite a few of them. Although I found that many of them actually have to do with translations because there are so many different translations of the Bible. For example, many will say that they remember dragons and unicorns being in the Old Testament, but now they are not. Well, if you grew up with the King James Version, there are many mentions of these mythical creatures, and this comes from the way it was translated from the Greek Septuagint, which did not always get the best meaning of some Hebrew words. And modern biblical scholarship understands the original Hebrew expressions to mean something different. So today, the majority of English Bibles translate what was once dragon as leviathan, and unicorns as wild oxen, or even rhinoceroses. The idea behind a true Mandela effect, however, is that there's no evidence that a change actually occurred, except for what is often called residue, but we'll talk more about that later. For example, there is no documentation that any of the logos were ever changed by the companies. So let's take a look at the story of Noah and the flood. What bird does Noah send out of the ark, and what does it bring back? Is it a raven or a dove? Did it bring back an olive leaf or an olive branch? Well, he sends out a raven first, then three doves, waiting seven days between each, and the second dove returns with an olive leaf. The last dove doesn't even return because it found dry land. Did the story change since we were children? Well, I think that holds the key to understanding the story and similar ones that involve a lot of details. Also, if you want more on the symbolism of raven and doves, check out this video. I'm willing to bet that the first time many of us heard the story of Noah's Ark, we probably didn't read it ourselves. We may have had it read to us from a parent or a preacher, and may have even seen it in a children's Bible. And when we hear it this way, we are really only hearing the highlights of the story. In fact, most illustrated children's Bibles will only mention one dove, and will show it with an olive branch. 
The international symbol for peace is a dove with an olive branch as well. So our memory of the story is not actually from the Bible itself, but from a retelling of the story or paintings. And visual memories and experiences are so much stronger than words by themselves. Speaking of memories based on images, what do you remember about the arrest of Jesus? All four Gospels record the detail that one of the disciples cut the ear off of one of those who came to arrest Jesus. And in John's Gospel, we are told that the victim's name was Malchus. But was he a soldier or a slave? Many people seem to remember him as being a Roman soldier, but he is the servant of the high priest in all four Gospels. What's even more interesting is that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, no soldiers are even mentioned. Only a group of men with swords and clubs are sent from the chief priests and elders. But we typically don't think of a mob arresting someone. Soldiers make much more sense in our modern heads. A small group of soldiers is mentioned in John's Gospel. That's also the only Gospel that tells us that it was Peter who cut off the ear of the servant. Now, that's not unusual. Most Christians conflate the Gospels and mix up details. But he's still not a soldier in John's Gospel. In fact, him even being a soldier really doesn't make a lot of sense. Besides, if Peter did this to a soldier, he would have been arrested as well. So I'll chalk this Mandela effect to being one of those false memories based on numerous paintings, passion plays, and even movies that depict the arrest of Jesus, which often include Roman soldiers. It's easier to remember soldiers than a mob of men with clubs. Of course, Mandela effect proponents might still ask, why so many images with the soldier? Is this evidence that it changed? And speaking about fun things to remember and paint, what about the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Okay, so that would make you war, famine, pestilence, and death. The verses in question here are in chapter 6 of Revelation. And an interesting note is that the name of the book itself has also been called a Mandela effect. Some claim that it used to be called Revelations, plural, although I have found no evidence that any translation of the Bible ever listed it as such. Its name comes from the Greek apocalypsis, which is the first word of the book and simply means revelation, or in context, the revelation of Jesus Christ. But let's get back to the horsemen. Some Mandela Effect theorists claim that they are often remembered as war, plague, famine, and pestilence. Of course, they are different in the Bible. At least, they are now. And really, plague, famine, and pestilence are very similar. Maybe you remember them as war, famine, pestilence, and death, as we heard in the above clip, and also how they appear in the television show Supernatural. But even that list is off. So which one is missing? Let's go to the text itself and see if we can figure this out. Then I saw the Lamb break one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures call out, as with a voice of thunder, Come! I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow. A crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, Come! And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that people would slaughter one another, and he was given a great sword. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come! I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's pay, and three quarts of barley for a day's pay. But do not damage the olive oil and the wine. When he broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, Come! I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed with him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, and pestilence, and by the wild animals of the earth. So we have different color horses, and each one has a symbol. So this should make it easier to remember. But only one of the horsemen actually has a name. And this is probably the biggest reason why they are not remembered correctly. So let's take a look at each one. The rider of the white horse can be called Conquest, based on its activity and his crown. That's the one that is usually left out, and really the subject of the Mandela Effect. The rider of the red horse could easily be called Murder, but is mostly associated with war because he has a sword. The next one rides a black horse and has a pair of scales. This is understood as Famine showing that weights and measures are off, supply does not meet demand, and people will pay crazy prices for food. The final horse is black and ridden by death, and he is followed by Hades, which referred to the place of the dead. So based on this, the riders would be conquest, war, famine, and death. But wait, the end of verse eight, I believe, is where things get mixed up in people's memories. 
It says that they were given authority to kill with, wait for it, sword, famine, pestilence, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So that's where we get pestilence, right at the end of the list of the horsemen. Could this be a Mandela effect? Well, I think that the descriptions of the writers are written in such a way that makes them difficult to remember. War and conquest are very similar, and so these two horsemen are often put together. Also, the way that famine is described is pretty interesting, with the scales and the economic turmoil, and so that one's pretty easy to remember. I would think that death is easy to remember as well, especially with depictions in art. So that leaves us with other words in the text, such as pestilence and wild beasts. Plague and pestilence occur quite often in the Bible, so it makes sense by association. Memories work in strange ways, but I think that's the best way to debunk this one. What about sayings in the Bible? You ever had a favorite saying that you said all of the time only to find out later that you were quoting it wrong or attributing it to the wrong person? This happens all of the time outside of the Bible, often because of the internet, and I'm sure most of you have heard this one. If you can dream it, you can do it. There are a few candidates as to who actually said it, but it was most likely Cheryl Silverstein, who coined it while working with GE and used it again during the building of the Epcot Center. And that's not really a Mandela effect, just a quote erroneously attributed to Walt Disney. There are lots of quotes that are attributed to the Bible or people think that they're in the Bible, but they're really not there. Like, God never gives you more than you can handle, or God helps those who help themselves. There are lots of phrases that Christian use that aren't biblical, but many are just sayings that have become popular over the years. But what about one that has been quoted so often, has been memorialized in artwork, and even has a verse attached to it? The lion shall lay down with the lamb. Isaiah 11, verse 6. One underlying theory about why these changes occur, if it's not just false memories, is that our universe split at some point in the late 20th century, and some people retain memories of what things were like before the split. There is a concept often used by those who believe in the Mandela Effect. It's called residue. Because it is believed, memories are not the only thing that has remained, and one might find evidence in an old newspaper clipping, or in a movie, or in an old piece of merchandise that still has the old logo or saying or what have you. These items are residue from the parallel universe or dimension. Now, the lion and the lamb has a lot of residue. We've all seen artwork depicting this, even stained glass in churches. Do a quick Google search of this verse and you'll find dozens of images of lions laying down with lambs. But let's look at the verse itself. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the lion will feed together, and a little child shall lead them." Okay, a few things to note. First, there are a number of animals in this verse. A wolf, a lamb, a leopard, a goat, a calf, and a lion, as well as a little child. So both a lamb and a lion are mentioned, but they are not paired up. In fact, it's the wolf that's lying with the lamb, and that does make a lot of sense since they were seen as natural enemies. The lion, however, is hanging out with the calf. Hmm, just doesn't look as great, does it? So why do so many remember the verse this way? Even without thinking about the images, it just kind of rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Even with different translations, the lion will live with the lamb, or will dwell with the lamb. The lamb shall lie down with the lion. There just seems to be a cognitive dissonance when we say the wolf will live with the lamb. And how many paintings do we see with a lion laying down with a cow? We don't. So what about other verses? Maybe this is being confused with other lions and lambs in the Bible. Well, the closest one that can be found that mentions both a lion and a lamb would be in the book of Revelation. There is one who is referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah in Revelation 5.5. 5. Then in the next verse, we are shown a lamb, looking as if it had been slain. But it doesn't stop there. In the same verse, the lamb has seven horns and seven eyes. So we are certainly dealing with some symbolic language here, but most scholars would agree that both the lion and lamb are understood to be about Christ. And this is not the only place that Jesus has been referred to as a lion or a lamb. So yes, we have these associations, and both of these verses have to do with end-time prophecies. But there's no mention of a lion laying down with a lamb, and these animals are talked about in different contexts. So with most of the biblical Mandela effects that we talked about, I think there's a pretty good explanation for them, whether it being a matter of translation or just a matter of the way that we remember things, especially with how we heard the stories growing up or with visual representations of them over time. But this one from Isaiah is a much more difficult one to debunk. Why would there be so much residue in so many people remembering the lamb and the lion together? What are your thoughts on this one?
So we had a bit of fun with this topic today, and I know that there are a lot of theories about why this happens. I tend usually to fall on the side of, well, that's just how our brain works. But I know there are a lot of people who are very passionate about some of the more supernatural or fringe theories about why the Mandela effect is occurring. Is it possible that we might be living in different timelines? That I don't know. But what does this say about the inspiration of scripture? Could have details been changed? And if so, what would it mean for believers? When it comes to the Bible, there are those who believe that something demonic is changing the verses. This I can't believe. Sure, the devil might try to use scripture to confuse or mislead, as when he tried to tempt Jesus before his ministry, but I don't think that even Satan has the ability to change the scripture in the way that the Mandela effect suggests. If we are talking about an alternate reality, well, I believe that the God of the universe is also the God of the multiverse. So if any changes did occur, they did so under his watchful eye. So it's not something that I'm going to spend any time really worrying about. Besides, the so-called changes in the Bible are not of great significance or details that challenge any specific doctrine of faith, unless there are some that I'm missing. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well, and maybe you have more examples of biblical Mandela effects. But if you enjoyed this and would like to see more biblical content, please consider subscribing to this channel. And thanks so much, and until next time, keep searching and reading between the lines.